Hallelujah. We worship you, mighty God. We worship you, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Holy One of Israel, the only Messiah, the one who died and rose from the dead, the one who is alive forevermore. You have the keys of hell and death. It is only through you there is eternal life. There is only forgiveness of sins through you. You are the only one by which we can be saved from eternal 
and damnation. We come to you, Lord, today and give thanks for your love that you willingly laid down your life on that cross to become the sacrifice, the atonement, the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And you said, if any man will hear your voice and will come to you, Lord, you'll give him the water of life. But you call sinners to repentance, Lord. You call us to turn from sin and wickedness and to follow you with all of our heart. And so, Lord, we pray that you will make that clear today. And, Lord, the rest of this time, whether it's until you come, Lord, whatever it takes, Lord, that you move upon the true message of the gospel. We pray that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Welcome everyone to Fire and Grace Church, those who are watching and listening, and half our congregation that's at home, I guess. I want everybody to turn to Second Chronicles this morning. We got a, I don't think I've ever preached anything from this passage. I want to point out something here. And yes, Second Chronicles chapter 12. <clears throat> Just go ahead and turn there. We'll get, get ready. And I don't know, I guess we, this is kind of like part two of come out of her, my people. Uh, I know we didn't call the last one that one, but that's what the Lord spoke to me, come out of her, my people. I went ahead and had them name it the Roman Catholic or Babylon, just so people would understand what we're talking about. But it's not just the Roman Catholic Church that's the problem, okay? It's not just the extreme charismaniacs that have taken things way too far and have connected with Rome and have all kinds of false signs and wonders and kundalini uh, spirits. We addressed that last week. And, of course, for those of you that want to know more, I addressed it in great detail in my book, The Polluted Church from Rome to Kansas City. I, I addressed it and exposed it and defined it and named the main players 12 years ago. Okay? And, of course, a few weeks ago, I've mentioned this, but it really is a problem. Um, but when we talk about the church world... You, you've got these extremes. You've got the extreme charismaniac, anything goes, supernatural. We don't discern anything, and we don't keep anything out. Anything goes. Uh, that's your Bethel church. That's Benny Hinn. That's uh, on down the line. In fact, yesterday, I found out something about Benny Hinn I did not know. I found out that Benny Hinn had a spiritual experience in which the passed away dead Catherine Coleman appeared to him and then after that he said and he spoke to her and then after that he said that's when the anointing came on me now let me tell you if you're communicating with the dead the anointing that comes on you is not the Holy Spirit and that explains to me why in 1991 when I went to a Benny Hinn crusade in Mobile one of the things that was absent from the entire show and I'm going to call it a show the carnival uh one of the things that was absent is the anointing, the presence of God, the power, the true power and glory of the Spirit. And, you know, it was amazing because it was an arena full of people worshiping God. Um, they had a beautiful choir singing. And I'm sitting there on the main floor just wondering, where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the anointing? Where is the glory of God? And... What I saw was some counterfeit crap. He comes up and waves his hand and blows on the crowd, and all these people start falling backwards. And I'm going to tell you, here's what happens. If the rows in front of you fall backwards, you're going down. And if I hadn't have, I mean, the people in front of me, the chairs collapsed, fell on me. I had, I, I mean, and then back then I was in my 20s, so I was a lot better shape and balance and all this stuff. I had to spin around 
And I was falling down, and there was a little four-year-old girl right under me that if I hadn't caught myself with both hands, I would have just crushed that poor little thing. And one of the things I said back then was, you know, and I went with some true brothers, and we went there truly open to see, is this God or is it not? And we did not find God there. We did not sense his spirit, his anointing, his power. Did we see some supernatural manifestations of some nonsense? Yeah, we did. Here's what's interesting, though. It, it was wild because back in those days, I was troubled by it, but the Lord spoke to me and said, do not talk about it now. Do not put your mouth on Benny Hinn just yet. And I didn't know why. And I think maybe the Lord was trying to deal with him as he did kind of try to repent of some things after that. Um, but as we see that nothing really has changed. And to me, though, it's troubling because, like, I found out yesterday, I didn't know this, but uh, Bill Johnson's deceased late wife, Benny uh, Johnson, that's not her real name, that she changed her name to Benny because to uh, of Benny Hinn. And there's just so many weird things. Uh, she was the one... Uh, the wife of Bill Johnson that would go to the lay on the graves and try to soak the anointing up from dead, uh, you know, ministers of the past. And, of course, they caught a lot of hell and flack for that, as they should. Um, let me just tell you right now, we don't have to seek the dead to have the anointing. We seek the living and we seek Jesus. Amen. That's where the anointing comes from. Uh, and here's the thing. If you love righteousness, as Hebrews 1 says, if you love righteousness and hate iniquity, hate sin, and that means these occult practices, that means the compromise, if you hate it, the Bible says the Lord will anoint you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. You want the anointing, you've got to hate all of this stuff that's evil, all this counterfeit, all the compromise all the sin, the Eastern religious practices and occult practices that they've adopted. you got to hate all that. And then if you do, if you hate it and speak against it and stand on the Lord's side, you will be anointed. That's a fact. And the anointing, that, and then when I say the anointing, that means the presence of God, the touch of God, the power of God, the unction as they call it, the unction and moving of the Holy Spirit will be upon you to pray, to fast, to witness, to lay hands on the sick, to cast out demons. You will have the real anointing to discern what is of God and what's not. But if you are just open to anything, if you think God's not serious about sin, if you don't think God's not serious about repentance from sin, if you don't think God's serious about keeping his house, his sanctuary clean of all of this counterfeit, demonic, occult practices, if you don't think all that's important, then what's going to happen to you is you're going to be swallowed up by this nonsense. I was blown away to find out. I mean, there's so many weird stuff. There, the worship leader at Bethel, just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, the worship leader at Bethel says that to, the Holy Spirit to her is like the genie from Aladdin. Okay? Now, the genies are jinns in Islam, and they are demons. How would you would ever compare the Holy Spirit to a demon? That's, that's actually blasphemy. And she's up there giggling about it. I heard Bill Johnson say yesterday, I, I'm listening to this whole series on it. I heard Bill Johnson admit that he was never called to the ministry. It's amazing how the Lord hits these people, I think, with the truth serum, and they just tell you the truth sometimes. right? But here's what blew my mind. That church has about 11,000 people that attend and 2,500 students in their school of ministry that might as well be um, Hogwarts. I mean, they're literally teaching people how to prophesy by just letting them try over and over again, no matter how many times they get it wrong. They're basically training soothsayers 
There's none of this wait till the Holy Spirit comes upon you and as he wills, let the gift of prophecy or word of knowledge or whatever flow through you. There's no balanced teaching whatsoever. Because the gifts of the Holy Spirit are as he wills, not as we will. You can't just decide, I'm going to prophesy. You, I, I don't get this. And you, you can't teach people how to prophesy. And this is what's so insane. But here's the thing. That is just one of our problems out there. And what I've tried to teach everybody is this. And so I've spent the last 15 years, but even before that I was preaching and teaching on this, is that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are still for the church, the true church, the true gifts. We don't have to settle for the counterfeit. We don't have to settle for an imitation. Uh, but what blows me away is how I, I think about this. Thousands upon thousands go to that church every Sunday, and it, it, is, it is a complete fiasco. I call it a crack fair. Y'all don't know what a crack fair is. I'm going to show you in a minute. Well, let's put, the, let's put the picture up. This is a crack fair. Why do we call it a crack fair? Because most of the workers there, they pull off the streets in Atlanta or somewhere, and they're, most of them are crackheads or meth heads or whatever. But let me, let me explain something to you. You see this carnival up here. Let me tell you, you, you take a child, you drive a child by this place, and they think, oh, look at the pretty lights, and there's cotton candy, and there's fun things to ride, and the children want to run over there and go to this. But the adults know that this is a charade, right? And that the crackheads and the games there are meant to take your money, right? But children are attracted to this. Adults know better. The kingdom of God is the same. But here we go. We, the, the, the children, the immature in the, in the church world are attracted to these carnival churches. That's why this men's thing, put up, put up the thing. You know, the thing that happened at this James River Church with this male stripper who stripped in gay bars and straight bars and he's up there ripping his shirt off and swinging on a pole in a church in a men's conference and let's just say okay let's just say he wasn't a male stripper but he was it's a fact but let's just say that he wasn't but it was just a circus act let me just go on and tell you this is what the church world has come to to attract the crowd to get people's attention they have created a crack fair. They have created a circus environment. And this is what they use to draw people. Well, let me just go on and tell you right now. Whatever you use to draw people to church or to Jesus that's not biblical, whatever you use to draw them is what you got to use to keep them. So this is why the show must go on. So let me put up the other one. Here, here's a picture. I just saw this. Somebody posted this little meme. The, the, uh, the modern church versus a nightclub. Do you see any difference between the two? And instead of alcoholic drinks, you got spirits, all right, that are flowing. But let me tell you something. If the Holy Spirit is upon something, if the Holy Spirit is moving, he will draw people, he will convict people, he will convince people, and you can't keep people away from it. See, I'm talking about the true ones. Now, the, now let me just say this. The true ones that are hungry for the real thing are always going to be in the minority. It's always going to be that way. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many go that way. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. But these carnivals, and let me just go ahead and tell you what, what, what a crack fair church is like. Oh, they're going to have program after program after program. 
They're going to make sure that they keep you entertained as much as possible. Lots of jokes and funny stuff going on. Lots of videos, lots of, lots of media. Usually coffee shops, donut shops. Get you high on sugar before you go in church. A lot of talk. I looked up one of our local mega churches. And I, you know what's so funny? As I've made this kind of funny statement that pretty much what they preach on is how to deal with stress in church. And sure enough, some of their last sermons are how to deal with stress, how to deal with anxiety. Let me just tell you, you want to deal with stress and anxiety? Get close to Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. Draw near to him. The reason there's so much stress and anxiety is people don't know who their rest is. They don't know him. They're not close to him. They haven't drawn near to Jesus by repenting from sin and lukewarmness and deadness. And, 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 and you know, I was talking to somebody last night and I was explaining that why, why some of these getting people to come out from this nonsense, these, these crack, go back to my crack fair, these crack fair churches. Because what they do is, these crack fair churches, they put enough of a facade forward that looks good. And most people can't handle strong, powerful, confronting, dealing with sin, Christianity. So it appeals to the flesh nature of give me, give, give me Christian light. Give me Christian light, right? Less filling, less calories. Give me Christian light because I can't really take that hellfire and damnation stuff. I can't take that stuff. I got to learn to love my wife as Christ loved the church or Oh, or the wives, I need to learn how to submit to my husband. You know, this bi biblical stuff. Oh, I can't divorce my, my wife and marry my secretary. Oh. Uh, no, that's, that's too biblical. And all this crap's going on and these scandals are going on. And... I told somebody last night and said, you know, it's not so much. They, they put forth enough truth, enough of a facade to keep people around. And then here's what they do. The leadership may be completely off. But then they'll have people that are true come into the church and start serving small groups and Sunday school classes and this and that. And so you got true people, right? That, that are genuine Christians. And then the, a person goes there and they go to one of these small groups and they get some help or they get some truth or they, they grow a little bit and then there's no convincing them after that that they're actually the institution itself is off base and that they should come out of it and flee from it. it it's amazing. It's almost, I call it getting inoculated from Christianity. What, what is the, the, I can't see, I can't even say the word, even though I'm not talking about anything. I cannot say the jibbity jibbity judo, right? You know what I'm saying. But what is the idea behind that? The idea behind that is to give you a little bit of the virus so that your body creates, your immune system creates antibodies for it, creates an immunity to it. Well, this is the problem. This is what most people don't understand, that we have so many churches now, and they're like, like somebody said, our friend Jeffrey said, they're like, they're, they pop up like Dollar Generals, or we call them McChurches. And how do I put it? What was, where was I going with that? Completely lost my train of thought there. What's that? Oh, the immunism, yeah. But we've got all these that give just a little bit. And here, but here, what it is, what they do, they get this, they get this weak water down Christianity inoculation. And when somebody comes along and says, hey, you're not getting the whole story. You're not getting the whole picture. You're not going, 
deeper and really coming to the knowledge of the truth, they're like, you're crazy. You're a cult. You're this. You're that. I mean, I've heard it all. And this is what the problem is. Now, I want to show you something. We said Second Chronicles. I'm going to show you. Let's just read this story here. Verse 1, and it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. Now, let's stop right there. I'm going to keep reading in a second. But this is when Solomon had died. And when Solomon died, the Lord said, because of Solomon's sin and all the idolatry and paganism and everything that Solomon opened the door to and brought into Israel, the Lord said, I'm dividing the kingdom. And ten tribes are going to be in the north, and two tribes I will reserve in the south, in Jerusalem. And, of course, Jeroboam became king of the northern kingdoms, and they created their own religion up there. And then Rehoboam became the king of the south. But what does it say here? It says he forsook the law of the Lord, meaning he forsook the word of God. And because of that, trouble began. All right? And it came to pass in the fifth year, King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Because why, why did the enemies come against them? Why was there war? Because they had transgressed against the Lord. And so this king of Egypt came with 1,200 chariots and threescore thousand horsemen. And the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Lubims and the Sukins and the Ethiopians. And he took the fence cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then Shemaiah, or Shemaiah, however you say that, the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Now let's, let's pause right there for a second. Here's a true prophet. A true prophet comes in and says, here is the problem. This is your sin, and this is the reason why this is going on in your midst. This is, this is what a prophet does. They don't have visions of dead people and talk to them and go lay on graves to suck up anointings. Okay? They spend time with God, and they hear from God, and, and, and prophets come and point out the problem, the sin, the wrong direction. And this is why prophets are hated and killed, not loved and flourished with money. <laughs> True prophets are hated even by the church. But a true prophet, like Nathan, comes to David. You are the man. You're the adulterer and the murderer. Knowing that King David, in a split second, could order them to take his head off. That's a true prophet. That's going to go tell the king his sin, even knowing that he may, it may be his last thing he ever does. He ain't there to tell you how blessed you're going to be no matter, how, no matter how much wickedness, sin, or evil you're living in. You're all just going to be so blessed. The best is yet to come. You, you hear that from somebody, run away. The best is yet to come. These prophets are the ones that promise peace, peace. The Bible says, Jeremiah said, that when there is no peace coming. He says, these false prophets strengthen the hands of evildoers, and nobody, they, their words don't make anybody turn from their evil way. They just go read Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 13. In fact, he says in there, they make you vain. Well, what does that mean? They make you empty, worthless. This is why you better be careful what church you attend. Because what you sit under, what you absorb, what you take in is what you will become. You ever heard? What you eat is what you are. Same, it's a spiritual thing, same thing. Say, Pastor Dean, let me tell you, cotton candy's good for a minute. 
And then there's diabetes, <laughs> rotten teeth, and you can't live on it. Do you think you could live long term off of cotton candy? No, you can't. But we have a cotton candy gospel being preached. And they fill up those churches by the tens of thousands because they're children that see the lights and the shiny things and the, and the pretty colors, and they don't understand that it's really a crack fair. They don't understand it's really just there to take your money. You hear me? Now, listen what happened. So the king of Egypt comes against them. Now, here's what's interesting. The prophet speaks to him, verse 6, and it says, Whereupon the princes of, of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. Now, this is what happens in the midst of some of these churches. They do get a few things right. You hear me? Oh, they'll say, We're about Jesus. We love Jesus. Come to Jesus. Oh, that's right. That sounds right. And sometimes they actually do humble themselves and say, you know what? The Lord is righteous. They, and they, they, they give a little bit of truth. And, and here's what's so amazing is that the Lord has mercy on them. The fact that they're allowed to continue the carnival is because it, it, here's what's amazing is that there are people that will come in there in these churches and sometimes find some help. They'll find Jesus in spite of the crack fair. Right? This is, this is like we, you might go to a crack fair and ride a ride and the bolts happen to, to be put in right that day and you, they don't fly off. Right? Now think about they put together these things and you know crackheads and methods are putting these things together. That's why I'm like, yeah, ride at your own risk. But it's the same thing. A lot of these, this, this whole mega church, seeker sensitive mentality, this whole Dollar General McChurch thing, it is truly right at your own risk. You know, Charles Finney was one of the greatest evangelists that, that ever, well, there ever was, really. The man understood God. He had such a, a relationship with God. He had such a he had such an understanding of how to preach the word of God and how to bring sinners to repentance. Uh, if you've never read anything by Charles Finney, you need to read number one his book uh, Lectures on Revival. Amazing. Uh, I read it very early in my Christian walk, and it laid the foundation in so many areas about how to preach the gospel, how to lead sinners to repentance, how to not give false comfort to sinners, how to deal with the backslidden Christians. It's a great book. And also, I mean, anything he wrote, but, but that in particular, Lectures on Revival and his memoirs are amazing. The man did not depend on any kind of carnival atmosphere. He didn't try to say, we're going to have a monster truck show and get a crowd and then preach, Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That was not what he did. What he did, he knew, and he said this in revival lectures, he said preaching must be direct. He said you must not just talk about sin as if you're talking about somebody else. He said you must make sinners figure out where they are. Matter of fact, you can just put this up real quick. These are just... You, you actually, revival lectures you can find online. There it is. Lecture, uh, lecture seven there, how to preach the gospel. And I love this. He always talked about this. He that winneth souls is wise. And he talked about how it takes great wisdom. But notice what he said. Let's go to the next one. And he said right here in this point, preaching should be direct. The gospel should be preached to men and not about them. The minister must address his hearers. He must preach to them about themselves and not leave the impression that he is preaching to them about others. He will never do them any good farther than he succeeds in convincing each individual that he means him. Many preachers seem very much afraid of making the impression that they mean anybody in particular. <laughs> they are preaching against certain sins, not that have anything to do with the sinner. 
He says, it is the sin and not the sinner that they are rebuking, and they would by no means speak as if they supposed any of their hearers were guilty of these abominable practices. Now this is anything but preaching the gospel. Thus did not the prophets, nor Christ, nor the apostles, nor do the ministers do this who are successful in winning souls. And then he says another very important thing to be regarded in preaching is that the minister should hunt after sinners and Christians wherever they have entrenched themselves. And he says, um, a minister ought to know the religious opinions of every sinner in his congregation. Indeed, a minister in the country is generally inexcusable if he does not. He has no excuse for not knowing the religious views of all his congregation and of all that may come under his influence if he has had the opportunity to know them. How otherwise can he preach to them? How can he know and to bring forth things new and old and adapt truth to their case how can he hunt them out unless he knows where they hide themselves he may ring changes on a few fundamental doctrines repentance faith faith and repentance till the day of judgment and never make any impression on many minds every sinner has some hiding place some entrenchment where he lingers he is in possession of some darling lie in which he is quieting himself. Let the minister find it out and get it out of the way, either in the pulpit or in private, or the man will go to hell in his sins and his blood will be found on the minister's skirts. This is just an idea. He's like preaching must be clear. We must address sin. We must not act like that it doesn't exist in our midst. You know, one of the most powerful things I've heard, like Sal and Daniela told me years when, when they started listening. God used a certain truth to get their attention, and they started listening to me. But they still were not truly surrendered and, and repented. They were still drinking some, some beers and partying a little bit, right? But they're listening to Pastor Dean. But let me tell you what got them. What got them is when I read Galatians chapter 5, and it says, No drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. And when I preached that directly and said, I don't care how you slice it, the Bible is clear. If you're a habitual drunkard, you get drunk on a regular basis, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You are headed to eternal damnation. Now, that is pretty direct, isn't it? Because the church world don't even talk about that. They don't even say anything about that. In fact, they got a lot of sipping saints in their midst. We know, Sal knows, Certain big church in town, some of the leaders, he happened to be doing some work in their house, and they love kicking back the alcohol on the weekends. And like I said, oh, I'm not, I, people say, oh, I'm not getting drunk, I'm getting tipsy. Let me tell you, tipsy is stage one of drunk. You understand? And let me tell you sometimes, all it takes is a little bit more after tipsy. And then your mind, you know, the Bible talks about this, how perverseness begins to come in the mind. Immediately as you get to that place where it's switching gears, it's amazing how all of a sudden when alcohol takes its root and the drunkenness starts to set in, the mind starts going toward perversion. It's like, a, it's like it almost breaks down your resistance. This is why it's so evil but it was that i remember sal telling me he was holding the beer one time and it just the conviction of the holy spirit it's like you've got to stop this and really get right with me you're not going to hear that in these mega churches i'm sorry you're not going to hear that in these dollar general mcchurches you're not going to hear it and this is what's so diabolical about them it's not always that you can find some serious false doctrine in some of these churches but it's what they leave out and this is why it's so hard to get people to come out of these places because they're like, but, but I don't see anything really seriously wrong or false or false doctrine. Yeah, but do they address, have you ever heard them address fornication, adultery, drunkenness? Have you ever heard them address lying and say, if you live habitually in these things, you will not go to heaven when you die. You will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, uh, and hear him say, cast this wicked, slothful serpent, serpent into outer, uh, servant rather, <laughs> serpent too, into outer darkness. Like I've said, well, anyway, you end up in the place of the one you follow. 
If you're a habitual liar, the Bible says you're going to the lake of fire and brimstone. If you're a liar, think about that. How many people lie? How many preachers get up and lie every Sunday? You're all saved no matter how you live. You're once saved, always saved. Oh, the grace of God. God understands all of these false doctrines they preach and all of this, this false comfort they give. Oh, these liars are going to find out that liars don't go to heaven. Deceivers don't go to heaven. And what he says here, Charles Finney says, how the blood's going to be on their hands. Let me tell you something. You do not want to stand before God with blood of others on your hands because you cause them to stumble and cause them to sin and cause them to die in their sins and go to hell. You don't want to be standing there as a stumbling block. Oh, because you left out the truth of the gospel. Now, I didn't finish. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles. We got a lot to cover. Let's go down to verse 9. It says, So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures out of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he took all, and he carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. So instead of which, or in the place of which, King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. Now this is what's interesting, and this is what, what I want to point out here. The enemy came in because they would not do things according to the word of the Lord. The enemy was allowed to come into the house of the Lord and the king's house, the leaders, and take all the treasures of the Lord. And it's interesting, it points out one of them and that Solomon had made these shields of gold. And gold in, in the construction of the tabernacle and all this represents the, the deity, the power of God. It represents purity because gold has to go through a purification process. It represents being tried by fire and being found faithful. But it says he took away, this enemy was allowed, by God allowed it because of their sins and transgressions. And even though they humbled themselves and said the Lord is righteous and God had mercy on them a little bit, it still says he allowed the enemy to come in and take the treasures out of the house of the Lord. And so what did Rehoboam do? So things would look the same, he made shields of brass. And what's interesting is brass kind of looks like gold if you shine it up enough. See, and this is what's happened to most of the modern church world. Because they refused to preach the gospel with repentance, because they refused to point out and deal specifically and directly and bluntly and frankly and plainly with sin in the camp and sin in the sinner's life. Because they refused to do it God's way, he's allowed the enemy to come in and take everything. So what do they do? When the anointing's not there, you've got to have a carnival. The shields of gold are gone, but the shields of brass are there. And so many people are fooled by the shields of brass. Oh, they think the blessing of God is still here. The presence of God is still here. The power of God is still here. Look at all the people coming in. Look at the thousands of people coming in the door. It must mean that God's blessing it. It must mean the anointing is here. The glory of God is here. No. The shields of gold are gone. Shields of brass now. And what does brass represent? The Lord talks about when the people of God would not do things according to his word and would sin. He said the heavens will be like brass, meaning your prayers are not heard. And really under judgment let me show you something. If you go to, go, go to Proverbs. Proverbs 21. 
Proverbs 21, 16. Let me show you something. Let me show you why these places are full. And I call them the congregation of the dead. Because I'm going to tell you this right now. If true repentance is not preached, if, a tr if the true repentance where you deal specifically with sin and the consequences of sin, where you preach on, as Paul did, and this is in Acts 24, when Paul said, when he stood before Felix, and he was preaching to these wicked Roman rulers, and he says, it says there that Paul reasoned with Felix. He reasoned of what? Righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. That means he dealt with righteousness. He, I can tell you right now, he said, you are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. How do I know that? Because that's the book of Romans, right? He is saying there is only one righteous, and that is Jesus Christ, and you must come to him, and you must believe in him that he died for your sins and rose from the dead, and you must repent of your wickedness. That is where righteousness comes into our life. And then it says he preached to him of temperance. How after that you must live a life of self-control. That the flesh cannot be allowed to have dominion. You must by faith and through Jesus bring the flesh under control. You can't just indulge it in drunkenness or adultery or fornication or whatever else that God has listed as sins. So he reasoned of righteousness and temperance, and then it says judgment to come. Meaning, if you don't do these things, the end result is eternal damnation, eternal punishment. In the lake of fire, the smoke of your torment will go up day and night forever. When Paul preached these three principles to Felix, this wicked Roman ruler, it says Felix trembled. In fact, you can put that, put that verse up. Felix trembled. Think about this. That's the, the preaching that we're supposed to do. Let me tell you something. If, if I don't make you nervous sometimes by how I preach and what I preach, if you don't tremble at God's word, if, if it doesn't strike fear in your heart sometimes, it is not the true preaching of the gospel. See, this is what it says. As he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, now, does this sound, modern churches, these Mac churches, these Dollar General churches, these seeker-sensitive churches would have told Felix, oh, it's okay. We're sorry we upset you or offended you. You want a brownie? You want a cup of coffee? God loves you just the way you are. Your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. It's okay. Don't cry. Don't. Don't tremble. Oh, the fear of God, you're afraid? That's not of God. Fear's not of God. Oh. They would have given them a little blankie, a little baba, a little binky, a little teddy bear to hold, and petted him on the head and said, sorry we, we disturbed you. Who was that mean man that disturbed you and made you upset? Come over here to our group, and you'll be loved. See, I would rather have sinners that tremble and don't accept Jesus yet because at least it's honest. Then to tell them, say this little prayer, raise your hand back there in the back. Nobody will see. Say this little prayer and you're good for all eternity. This is the Christianity that we've had. Charles Finney had a thing called in his meetings, he called it the anxious seat. <laughs> I love this. The ancient seat, right? So what he would say is he had been preaching, and he would come and preach for days. You know, and sometimes he would have a, a weak revival plan, and he ended up being there for six months preaching. But he would say this. He says, if you feel anxious or anxiety over your salvation or where you are, like you're trembling, 
and you feel insecure, you don't know whether you're saved or not, or you're, you're troubled or unconviction about your sin, he said, come up here and sit in the front row. He made him come sit up in the front. And he was the one that said your preaching should be like a machine gun that just lays them out, just, just destroys every place that they hide. This is the man, though, that when he went up to Rochester, New York in 1831 and started preaching, he ended up there for six months and 100,000 people got saved, and that was without radio, TV, or social media. This is the man who walked into a factory and two girls, there was thousands of people, about 3,000 people working in this factory, and he walks into the factory, they're giving him a tour before, you know, just showing him around before he preaches that evening. And two, two young ladies kind of looked and said, oh, that's the preacher, and kind of mocked him and laughed at him. And as he said, he said, I just looked at him with a, t like Finney was, they said he was about 6'4", he was an athletic man, very strong. And they said that, that he just, like, take his hat off and just looked at him. The conviction and fear of God came into that place. And they, they, they began to tremble, and they began to get, like, that, anxious and started feeling and, and finally the the fear of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was so strong in the factory that the supervisor said came out and said we must shut down the factory it is more important that we deal with our souls than this factory keep running and about 2,000 people out of the 3,000 that worked in this factory got saved that day but it was the fear of God the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That makes you uncomfortable. If you're in sin, if you're a sinner, you're lost, you're deceived, you're, you're in sin, or you're a backslidden Christian. And there is some, the true power of God comes into place. The true fear of the Lord, the true conviction of sin, the true reality of where you really are, where you're, the deception is stripped off of you and broken off of you. You see yourself as you really are, and you see your condition, and you see your fate. That is when true conversion takes place. That is when true repentance can take place. See, I, you will never be comfortable under my preaching, if you choose to live in sin, you will either repent, get it right with God, or you will find a crack church. Because you won't want the shields of gold. You'll go find the shields of brass. Because that's easier to handle. Because they don't do things according to the word of God. The law of God is not there to make me tremble. I can have a good time. I can relax. I have had people tell me they go to these big mega churches so they can hide. So they can hide. What you hiding from? And let me tell you, there's a lot of people on this kick about churches being 501c3, all this nonsense. That is not the biggest problem. A church can be 501c3 and still have a pastor that preaches the truth and people that are, are living for God. And they, that, that doesn't, it's, it's if the pastor allows the 501c3 thing to influence how they preach. That's the problem. Now, we're not 501c3, never have, because I understand the law. The church, and it's on, it's on the IRS website, by the way, churches cannot be taxed. You don't have to file a 501c3. You don't have to do anything. The government cannot tax a church because the moment the government can tax a church, then it has power over a church, and that would violate the First Amendment of our Constitution because they cannot restrict the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. And the moment you tax something and we don't pay the tax or whatever, then they can start restricting the church. That's why churches are something, an entity totally different they created the 501c3 thing for nonprofits that were not churches. And they just convinced churches, sign up for this, and then told them a lie that if you say certain things, you'll lose your tax-exempt status. A church can't lose its tax-exempt status. So that's all a lie. It's all built upon a lie. 
So the, but the pastors that's chosen to believe the lie and compromise, that's the problem. I mean, you know, I've seen God move the power of God. Revival happened in 501c3 churches because the pastors, just, they don't even regard that as anything. That's just the way the church was set up. Probably a lot of them long before they ever became the pastor there. So that's not the issue. The issue is what do you let control what you preach? If the, if the pastor wants to keep a big congregation and big money and he's willing to compromise and water it down and to make sure he doesn't preach or say anything that's offensive or would make anybody tremble or feel uncomfortable, that's the problem. Because he's become, he, he's, he's become a circus, you know, the ring, the ringmaster, the ringleader, instead of a preacher of the gospel, a preacher of the word of God. Now, let me show you something. The people that stay in these places, listen to what this says. This is a, this is a scary verse. This is a, it's a telling verse, though. But Proverbs 21, verse 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Ooh. You stay in the Roman Catholic Church. You stay in these mega churches that, that, do, that do not preach the gospel, don't make anybody uncomfortable. There's no conviction of sin. There's no talk of sin. There's no talk of hell and eternal punishment, the judgment of God, the judgment day. There's no talk of the wrath of God. It's only the love of God, the mercy of God. If that's all you ever hear in a place, and you stay there. You stay in that. You stay in these dead Lutheran churches, these dead Baptist churches, these dead Presbyterian churches, these dead Pentecostal churches. Oh, yes, there's dead Pentecostal and charismatic churches. I mean dead. I mean the whole thing is a show from beginning to end. But it says the man that wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. What's the flip side of that coin? If you get some understanding of what the Word of God says and get some understanding of what the Holy Spirit wants you to do, you will not stay in the congregation of the dead. You will come out of her, my people. You will find a group. I don't care if it's a small group that meets in a house. You'll find some people that want to tell the truth and preach the whole truth and want the fear of God and the power of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit even if it makes us uncomfortable, you will want that. And you'll want to be around people like that. And let me just go ahead and tell you this. As Christians, this is the gospel. When the God tells you to be a light and a witness for him, this is the gospel you are to preach to people. If you've got a friend and you know that friend's in adultery, you need to be able to go to them and say, look, Here's what the Bible says. No adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. You've got to come out of that. You've got to quit doing that. You've got to repent. You've got to ask God for forgiveness and stop this mess, this sin you're in, and come out of it. If you want to be forgiven, if you want to inherit eternal life, you're going to have to get right with God and get out of this stuff and quit doing it. That's showing you love somebody, not petting them on the head saying God loves you and just he understands your struggles. No, he understands you're an adulterer. And adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Said, in fact, let's read this. I love how Kamari said this the other day. He said, I love these lists. Because it's easy. It's easy to understand. Let's read Galatians 5, 19 through 20. Just so y'all know what I'm talking about. Because there's new people listening every day. He says this. Real plain. Now the works of the flesh are manifest or revealed. It's not hard to understand. It's clear. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, which fornication, porny of the word, is an all-encompassing word that covers every type of sexual immorality there is. So he says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. 
back up. Heresies, false doctrines. If you're teaching false doctrines, you're in trouble. Let's keep going. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, which means drunken partying. Let's read it again. Envings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, he says, of which I tell you before, Paul saying, I've already told you this, as I also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Pretty simple. The word do, I've said it so many times, I don't even have to look it up anymore. Greek word, prasso, means, look it up, Strong's Greek Dictionary, to practice habitually so he lets you know if you practice any of these things in a habitual manner now a christian may do one of these things but a christian is not going to live in them a christian is not going to keep on committing them and wallow in them like a pig that keeps rolling around in the same mud puddle no the christian that repents gets up out of the mud puddle and asks jesus please cleanse me and wash me i'm not going back to that mud puddle See, a long time ago, I was a fornicator. I quit fornicating. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. You can quit. You can repent. I was a drunkard. Guess what? Not a drunkard anymore. You understand? That's repentance. And why, why we put these things, look, all of us know that the flesh side of us, no matter how strong a Christian we are, the flesh side of us, the carnal side, the side we inherited from Adam and Eve, that side of us wants to do all these things. The flesh wants to have pleasure in unrighteousness. We are always in a war with that. But the false church, the churches of the shields of brass, the carnival churches, they don't talk about these things because they want everybody to feel good about themselves and secure and happy and joyful. And we just don't want to approach such negativity. Oh, these preachers, like me, they think, oh, man, if I went in there, if I became the pastor of the Highlands, I can assure you attendance would drop dramatically. Why? Because I would preach very differently every week until I caused some people to tremble. I walked into a mega church in Montgomery years ago, and you know, God, when he called me to the ministry, he called me to be a prophet. And sometimes that, that office will rise up and I remember, I wasn't expecting anything. I walk in this mega church in Montgomery, Alabama. I walk in, and then you walk in the back doors, and you walk in another door, and you, and you were in the sanctuary. And it's seated about, I think there were about 2,000 people, maybe more, I don't know. And I remember immediately, I had my eyes open, and I see a vision. And it was the word fornication written, and it was, it was like in an, in an arch, going over from one end side of the congregation all the way to the other side. And I knew the Lord was saying that this problem of fornication, sexual sin and immorality, was a serious problem there. So you know what I did is I started attending because one of my friends were on staff there, and I started attending for a little while because the Lord wanted me there. And I started attending for a little while, and let me tell you, sure enough, you know what I found out? The worship team, full of adultery and fornication. The pastors knew it was going on and did nothing about it. And, and I waited, and I sat there in the congregation. I was there for about one year, and I waited on the Lord. The Lord was like, you wait and listen. For one year, the pastor, I was there every Sunday. The pastor had an opportunity to specifically address the problems in his church, sin, 
adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Not one time in 52 weeks, 52 Sundays, did he ever specifically talk about sin and the need to repent and turn away from it? Not one time. So the Lord had me write him so it would be in writing. A pro that prophetic word, that vision the Lord showed me and what the Lord had revealed to me, what he gave me to tell him, you are going to have blood on your hands. You have not warned them. You have not preached the truth to them. You have not told them. Your congregation is filled with this sin. It is rampant here. And you never address it. Because he wanted to build a big, even a bigger church. He wasn't satisfied with 2,000 members. Wasn't satisfied with having a big, nice building and land and all. No, not satisfied. We got to be bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. See, that, that, that whole thing about we just got to be bigger, 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 bigger. We got to have more money, more money, more money. You know, as a pastor, I got to look like a big shot having my own airplane. I got to have somebody carry my briefcase for me. Now, son, if you're too weak to carry your briefcase, time to get in the weight room. Have a little entourage. I, I'm so sick of this. But that church, let me tell you, it never fixed the problem. You know what was funny? is the day the Lord told me to leave. He told me when I was leaving. This was the end of 2007. He said, you're, you're leaving now. And I was, I was going over to Georgia to help my brother start a church. And, of course, that God was leading me so I'd go find my wife. That was the whole reason, really, I went to Georgia. But I remember I went to their, like, New Year's Eve service, and they had this prosperity prophet come in there who called himself a seer. Well, they love that. I'm a seer. Really? Okay. It's funny how much you don't see, seer. All right. And I remember it was this little prosperity preacher, prophet guy. He, he, he had him there because, again, they love these prosperity guys, so they come in and help, you know, take up big offerings for them. And don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Now, y'all got quiet like Lutherans there for a second. All right. But I remember I was standing in the back, and this guy, you know, he preached his little prosperity message. And, and I'm getting ready to leave, and the Lord tells me, you know, he gives an altar call for people, and he starts giving prophetic words out. And I'm like, and laying hands on people. I'm like, Lord, I, I'm not going up there. I don't want that guy laying hands on me. And the Lord said, go up there. I'm like, no, Lord, no. I do not want this Kundalini prophet laying hands on me. I don't want this. The Lord said, I told you, go up there. Okay. Here's what's funny. There were people in front of me. And I went up. I walked up to the altar. And that basically, they just had steps up to the platform. And I was standing there. And the pastor that I had just given the letter to about what I saw and dealing with sin, a true prophetic word. He was standing right like, he was standing right next to me. So I'm standing there, the pastor's standing there. This little prophet, this little prosperity prophet, it's amazing how God, God, God will move sometimes. He'll, he'll speak through a donkey if he wants to, right? He, that, that little prophet guy, prosperity prophet, walked down a few steps. He didn't walk over to me and didn't lay hands on me. God kept that from happening. So I was hate to have to resist him, right? But that prophet was going around. He was praying for people, and he said, Lord, let them see. Make them a seer. Let them see. Make them a seer. And he was praying this over everybody. And guess what? Everybody's not called to be a prophet. Let's go ahead and admit that, all right? This whole idea, oh, well, everybody's a seer. No, they're not. All right, and he's he's that's what he's praying over everybody. Oh God, make him a seer. Let him be a seer. Da, 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 da. He steps down from the the steps to the platform and he starts walking towards me and he points at me, and he says, "You already see." Right in front of the pastor, so the pastor could hear it. You already see everything. He said, 
And I'm like, the Lord had this little prophet that this pastor thinks is a prophet confirm he just got a prophetic word about his whole church. You know how many years ago? That was 2007. Do you know they have yet to deal with those problems? How many people have died and gone to hell because of that? Not because of what they preach, because of what they don't preach. It's sad. And there's people that I know, friends, old friends of mine that aren't necessarily friends anymore, that know that that were true Christians that knew about all this sin going on in the camp and would not leave that are still there. And I think about this scripture, the the man that wanders away from understanding will remain in the congregation of the dead. Here, here's what's going to happen. If you, if you start reading the Bible for yourself and say, God, show me the truth. I want you. I want to know the truth. He's going to show you. And it's probably not going to be as comfortable as you had hoped it would be. And then he's going to lead you out of these dead places. I'm just going to tell you right now. Because, see, hear, hear me out. If these places, if these, put up my, my crack fair again. If you go to these crack fairs right here, and what they're made to do from buying the tickets to ride the rides to the, the games that are fixed and everything else is to just get money out of you. But hear me out. If you give money to these things, these crack churches, you are helping them push their message, their agenda. This is why, as a Christian, you cannot remain in these places and give them your money and your time and your energy and your service. Even your attendance is helping them look successful. Come out of her, my people. See, it's not just the whore of Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church. It's all her daughters that are the problem. And she not only has daughters, but she has adopted children. Because they pretty much do the same things and teach the same doctrines. They're just westernized, Christianized in a way. Little popes. Oh, yeah, you come here to church, you serve in the children, you're, you're a good church person, you're a server, serving person here. Ching, you just check the box to heaven. No, you better make sure you are where the Lord wants you to be. I would rather be with two or three people down by the river in a tent and have the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God and the fear of God there than be in these palaces that are just carnivals. You hear me? You know, the fear of the Lord. You think it's not a New Testament thing? Go to Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, verse 1 says, in the, in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, what is hypocrisy? What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy means that you pretend to be something on the outside, that you're really not on the inside. You're not for real. It's, it's, a, it's a faking. And this is the leaven Jesus is warning about. The outward appearance of righteousness, the outward appearance of piety and devotion, 
religiosity. He says it's this outward thing is the leaven of the Pharisees. He says, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in the closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I want to tell you, more and more, you mark my words, more and more of these pastors and these mega churches and are going to be exposed because there's stuff going on in secret. Because if it wasn't going on in secret, they would preach against the sin. They usually don't preach against the sin because they're in the sin. But he says, as this is Jesus speaking, he said, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Jesus teaching, fear him who can cast you into hell. That's Jesus preaching. You do not hear this in these crack carnival churches. This is the stuff that makes people tremble. Jesus said stuff that, can you imagine? And the word here is phobeo in Greek. Guess what it means? You ever, you, you ever heard where we get the word phobia from? But it means fear, terror. Paul said this, go to 2 Corinthians 5. Speaking to Christians. Second Corinthians five. Talking about the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is where Christians will stand to be judged, not the unsaved. And he says this. We go down to verse 10. He says, for we. Now, if the, if the apostle says we, who's he talking about? He's including himself. So he's talking about we Christians. He said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Wait a minute. I thought Christians were eternally secure no matter how they live. So what's, what's the worry? What's the terror? Why do we have to persuade Christians to live holy lives? To hate sin, to repent of sin. Why? If we're covered by grace, and that's all that matters, it's grace, grace, grace. Why is there terror for Christians? Because some Christians that stand before the judgment seat of Christ are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. And others are going to say, hear, hear him say, Jesus say, take him, bind him hand and foot. Cast him in their outer darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Take that wicked, slothful servant. Take him out of here. He says at the judgment seat, there are going to be people come in to the judgment seat. Come into the wedding. It's right at the, before the wedding. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's when all Christians are going to be taken. Listen, all Christians are going to be taken up. Dead. We are dead in Christ. So rise first. Then we which are alive. It's at the last day. Right at the same time, God starts raining down the great day of his wrath. Yes, there's a rapture, but it's at the end, the last day, the same day that the world, God destroys all the cities of the world and all of the mountains come down and the islands are moved. And we're in heaven. And he says, this is Matthew 22. He gives this story, this parable. He says, we're at the wedding feast and one comes in here not having on a wedding garment. And Jesus turns to him and says, friend, how is it that you've come in here not having on a wedding garment? And it says that the man was speechless. And the Lord said, take him, bind him, hand and foot, cast him in outer darkness. This is at the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a thousand years later where the wicked dead are judged at the great white throne. This is 
at the second coming of Jesus. There's only two judgments, folks. The second coming of Jesus, the judgment seat of Christ where Christians will be judged. And then a thousand years later after the millennial reign, the wicked dead, everyone will be brought up to stand before God. And that's where the severity of your eternity will be determined. Because, you know, there's going to be degrees of eternal punishment. But folks, you, the, the Baptists have taught for years, oh, the judgment seat of Christ is just where you're going to lose some rewards, but you're still going to be saved. You better get that out of your head. Oh, yes, rewards will be dished out there to those who make it in or the lack thereof. I ain't worried about rewards. I don't care what rewards I get or don't get. I just want to make it in. I, I, people talk about, oh, I'm going to have a crown of jewels. I don't care about a crown. I don't, I don't care. Some people say, oh, I'm going to have a mansion. I don't care. Give me a shack. I'll take a shack in heaven, no crowns. Just let me be there. I want to make it there. And that's why Paul said, oh, I hope that I make this gospel that I preach, which is why I bring my body into subjection and make it obey me. Because I could become a castaway. Paul even said if he let his flesh take over and rule him, that he himself could become a castaway, a reprobate. Don't tell me you a Christian can't fall away. But here, here's the shocker. Hey, all people talk about, oh, 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 with the rapture, uh, if you're a lukewarm, backslidden Christian, you get left behind. No, you don't. See, this is the scary thing. You're going up there to stand before his throne. Whether you write with him or not. Think about the Christians who have backslidden and are now living as homosexuals or adulterers and going to be snatched out of their homosexual bed one night to stand at the judgment seat. And the Lord's going to say, Yeah, how are you? What are you doing here with no wedding garment, the robe of righteousness, that white linen that's clean? What are you doing here? And see, the thing that he tells, you know, in the, the parable of the talents, when he tells that wicked song, he said, you knew, you knew what you were supposed to do, and you didn't do it. You see, it's the preacher's job. It's the pastor's job to scare the hell out of you. Say, Pastor Dean, I just can't accept that. <laughs> It just disturbs me. I'm just a delicate flower. Jesus is the one who said, you better fear him that after he's killed the body can put you in hell. Fear him. Look, I know God loves me, but I also know he means what he says and he will do what he has said he will do. And if he says the drunkard will not inherit the kingdom of God, if he said all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, I believe that. So therefore, it's a good deterrent in my life. But if you get the idea that grace is somehow this license to sin and that God's going to overlook and you can live however you want and still go to heaven, you have been deceived by the devil and this is most of that church world. You know, years ago, and I'm just going to say it, the Highlands is the big mega church here in Alabama. I'm just going to tell you right now. I had one of my staff members back in the day. He's not here anymore, but back in the day, he decided, I want to call their offices, and I want to find out where they stand on the doctrine of once saved, always saved, no matter how you live, or do they believe a believer can fall away and be lost? What do they believe? Guess what? He could not get a straight answer out of any of their staff or any of their pastors that he managed to get on the phone. Couldn't get an answer to the question, which tells me they didn't want to answer the question. Because that had been too offensive. To be too straightforward, and we certainly don't want this out if we believe what we believe. So it's better to be vague. And this is, and this is another problem. They're just vague. I've had people say, Pastor Dean, you're just too, it's, you're pretty, it's too strong for me. You know why it's too strong? Because you've been on the milk too long. 
You've heard weak, little, skinny jeans, effeminate preachers. <laughs> Too long. They talk real sweet. I'm going to tell you, 99 times out of 100, if they have an effeminate spirit on them, they're usually in that effeminate sin, if you get my drift. Girly men are usually problematic. That's why I, I'm like, does it take a rocket scientist to figure out that a men's conference shouldn't have a male stripper? I don't know. It's just me. Like I said, who booked that guy? But let me just go and tell you, if you had the Holy Spirit, if you had the anointing, if you had the glory of God, you don't need a male stripper. You don't need a, a circus act. You don't need a smoke machine. You don't need pyrotechnics. You don't need music that's so loud that it's, it's damaging people's hearing, literally. I mean, we had to have earplugs when we went to Greg Locke's church for the debate. That's how loud it is in there. They had a lady come in with a decimal reader and tell them that this is so loud, this is hurting babies' ears. This is damaging their ears. It's dangerous. And they wouldn't turn it down. But guess what? You don't need that if the anointing's there. You know what I loved about this past Skyfall 2023? As we had Mark and Hannah Pong leading worship. We didn't even have drums. I couldn't find our drummer. But we, he, he played electric guitar, and she played the acoustic guitar, and they sang together. And you know what? It was kind of quiet. It was kind of subdued. But you know what? The anointing was there. It wasn't a show. It was to worship the Lord and to give him glory. And every time they started worship, I could feel the glory of God and the presence of God coming. Because I know them. I know their heart's right. I know they're living right for God. And I know where their, their heart is to worship God in, in purity and in truth. That's why I don't call in, you know, striper <laughs> to lead worship. I'm sorry. I don't want a rock band. I want to worship. I don't want somebody that's trying to climb their way up the Christian charts. And you know what? Talent doesn't mean you have the anointing either. You can be the best musician, the best singer. I want the glory and the presence of God. And see, he promised that if we would fear him, if we would reverence and respect him, if we would tremble at his word, if we take it that seriously. I don't know if any of you, but I still tremble when I think about the night I drove from Auburn, Alabama to Valley, where I was living at the time, 30 miles, so drunk, driving that I don't remember the trip the whole 30 miles and the next thing I know I had passed out at the wheel and the next thing I know something wakes me up now I had been taking we'd been playing quarters with straight shots of 190 proof clear spring I was Let's put it this way. On the, on the side of drunk, I was probably close to death, the level of alcohol I had in me. You usually don't wake up once you pass out. Something woke me up. And I know to this day that it was because of my, the prayers of my great-grandmother and my great-aunts praying for me that God supernaturally woke me up. Because the moment I woke up in my Pontiac Firebird headed off the road... I had to, I was headed 70 miles an hour, headed straight for a tree. And I snatched the wheel back to the left, and the car spun. I don't know how many times it spun. And I ended up in the right lane in the right direction. Missed the tree by maybe this much. Another second or two, and I'm into that tree at 70 miles an hour without a seatbelt, and I'm a dead man. And I'm waking up in hell going what happened 
And if that doesn't make you shudder, see, I shudder at that. And that's what the Lord says. Will you not tremble at my word? See, it's not a doubt. I don't doubt that God loves me. I don't doubt that Jesus died for me. I don't doubt that the the way has been made for me. But I chose at 16 in a church. I said no to him. He called me. I said no. And it was right after that that I nearly died. And I'm thinking about I said no to him. I said, no, I'm not following you now. I want to do what I want to do. It was a conscious decision. I wanted to still drink, party, and, and, and live in sexual sin. And I could have died that night and been in hell. And just the thought of that. I, I mean, to this day, that's been almost 40 years ago. I think about, God, thank you. Thank you that you had mercy on me when I was rebelling Living in sin, disregarding you, choosing to not fear you. Go to Psalm 36. I'll try to bring this in for a landing. This, is, this has been on my mind. Psalm 36. The fear of the Lord over and over, over and over. Throughout Proverbs, even in the Psalms. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What does he say here? Psalm 36, verse 1. The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. Can I just tell you the transgression of the wicked can be among the unsaved and the saved. The saved can choose to live in transgression and wickedness. But if they do, it says there is no fear of God before their eyes there is no true reverence there is no true trembling at his word and let me tell you right now if these preachers in these mega churches these mech churches these seeker sensitive watered down churches if they truly had the fear of God in them they would preach about sin and true repentance and living for God the way you're supposed to, following Jesus the way you're supposed to, because they would be, they would be terrified not to. And so because they won't even address it, because their goal is not to convict sinners, but to build big congregations, it shows me that they have no fear of God before their eyes. None. And it's a scary thing because I see the multitudes, thousands and thousands of people go to these places. Thousands. I don't know how many thousands were at this men's conference where they had the stripper. But the problem was there were several thousand people there. And what was troubling is when Mark Driscoll spoke against it and rebuked it. He, people were cursing him. And, I mean, so-called people in the crowd were cursing him and threatening him and everything else. But only 100, they said only 100, 200 got up and walked out. You see, again, and then they talk about, oh, but a lot of men came to Christ. Let me tell you something right now. Adding somebody to your church membership or somebody that signs a card or says your little prayer does not mean they're converted. It does not mean they have truly repented. It doesn't mean they truly fear God enough to depart from evil. Somebody told me, who was it? Somebody told me, somebody was talking to me the other day about a church that does evangelism and and they go out and they actually read to people. They got this little thing they read to people and if people will stand and listen to them, they count that person as a, as, as a soul saved for Christ. And then they go report that as, oh, we led these people to Jesus. You know, they used to call that not evangelistic, but e- 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 what is it, e- elastic. I can't remember the term exactly, but stretching the truth a little bit there, right? So a lot of this so-called, oh, we had 500 men get saved. Really? 
Let me sit down and talk to them. We'll find out how many of them really got saved. And this is what, we're, we're not making converts, true disciples of Jesus, true born again believers. We're making converts to our crack fair. Come get high on this emotional preaching we got so you can feel the bubbly joy of being at peace with your sin, not being made to feel any kind of discomfort. See, I want to tell you right now, when God truly moves, the glory of God comes in, the fear of God comes in, the respect and reverence of God, and the reverence of his word. You will not take it lightly. This is what he said about the false prophets. He said, they make you vain. They're light and frivolous. You know, I think about Samuel. He was a true prophet. Matter of fact, it says he was a prophet and says he was a seer. A seer and a prophet is the same thing. Not everybody's called to be a prophet slash seer. But, but Samuel's reputation of being on the Lord's side, of standing for righteousness and for truth, of speaking the truth like he did to Eli the high priest. He was a little scared as a young man to speak the truth to this backslidden high priest. But he obeyed and gave him the truth, and the man fell over and died. And his son, God killed his wicked sons that he wouldn't restrain. But Samuel had a reputation for walking with the Lord and walking in righteousness and holiness and being a true prophet, a true seer. And I love this. When the Lord sent him to Bethlehem, <laughs> this is so good, to anoint David. He sent him to Bethlehem. It said the elders of the town trembled and said, why are you here? Why did they tremble? Because they knew. They knew God is with this man. He may see through my soul. He may discern I'm in adultery. He may discern my wickedness and my sin. What is he here to do? You know, I've literally had that said to me at times. I went to visit this particular family that I had known for years, and they knew me. That I was serious about this stuff. And I remember one of the teenagers answered the door when I, what, and it was like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And I was like, yeah, you probably in sin. I'm making you nervous just standing here. But it's not because I hate people. I love people enough to tell them the truth, even if I know it's going to upset them. So that they can truly come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and understand how he feels about sin, wickedness, compromise, lukewarmness. You know, Jesus spoke to the church of Sardis and he said this in Revelation 3. He said, you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Boy, how many churches give this outward appearance that they are alive. Oh, there's a big carnival going on. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of colors and lights and pizzazz. But they're really dead. I don't want to live in the congregation of the dead. Because you know what happens if you hang around dead bodies too long? The stench and the rot begins to get on you. And what's so bad is if you stay in it long enough, you know if you stay in a place that stinks long enough that you stop, you stop stinking so bad. You, you become, what they call it, nose blind. <laughs> and this is where a lot of people are. They're in the congregation of the dead. And the Lord's saying, you know what? Come out of her, my people. Time to get serious. Time to be part of the five wise virgins and not part of the five foolish. Time to make sure your lamps are full of oil and you're on fire and you're ready instead of playing the game and still asleep 
All ten were virgins. All ten were looking for the bridegroom. All ten were, but only five were ready. Come out of her, my people. Yeah, I heard the Lord say that so clear last week. And when I was praying yesterday, it just kept, it kept reverberating in my mind and my heart from him. He's just come out of her. Come out of this dead church system. Come out of it. Come out of the errors and the lies. If you have to sit at home for a while and just read your Bible until you figure out the truth, do that. Do whatever you got to do to make sure that you are dealing with yourself, that you are dealing with your sin, that you are repenting, that you have the fear of the Lord in your life. Because guess what? Most of the time, there's not going to be anybody to help you. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to do it. And if you do, then the Lord can lead you to people who are like-minded, who can help you grow in your faith and your walk and help hold you accountable. You know, we all need that. That's why I tell people about a church family how important it is because, you know, it's one thing. I know, I know we got a lot of people that watch. I've got thousands of people that watch every Sunday. And some of them are like, oh, I'd love to be there. I'd love to move to Alabama. I'd love to attend your church. Well, yeah, maybe so. Because it's different when you're here because we have to deal with family problems here. And sometimes it's you are the family problem. And that's not always comfortable. And that's why I tell people, I love for you to come. If God's leading you to come, hey, come to fire and grace. Yes, absolutely. But make sure it's the Lord. Make sure you know it's his will. Because it's not always going to be, you know, there'll be some bumpy spots in the road. And you might have to get corrected. And if you're too delicate of a flower... You might not be able to handle that. Because we've had some come here, thank God sent them here, and when the rubber met the road and I had to deal with problems, they ran out the door and some of them went to the highlands. They'll be fine there. They're just a little too delicate flowers. Can't handle the truth. Let's stand. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Somebody say amen or oh me. <laughs> See, Jesus said the lukewarm Christian and gets spit out of his body. See, I read that and I, it makes me tremble. Lord, don't let me be lukewarm. What did he say about the lukewarm Christian? He said, you don't even know that you're blind, wretched, miserable, poor. Dang. You don't know it. You're blind to it. I don't know about y'all, but I pray, Lord, if I'm lukewarm, please show me. I don't want to stay blind to it. You say, well, Pastor Dean, how would you? But you, you, you're living for the Lord. Let me tell you, we're all flesh. We're all human. You better all check yourself. Paul told the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, he said, examine yourself. See whether you be in the faith. He was talking to Christians. Examine yourself. Where are you? Are you on fire? Are you... Living a holy life. Are you seeking the will of God? Are you hearing his voice and following him? Are you sharing his word with people? Are you truly living for him or yourself? Are you fighting the flesh? Are you indulging the flesh? It's not complicated. I want to live for Jesus. I want to be those, one of those that endures to the end so that I may be saved. I want to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians 2, 12. Think about that verse. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then Paul says in chapter 3, I don't count myself to attain anything, but I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling. Well, what is the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus? It's that you make it there to be with him for all eternity. That's all I want. I don't want a crown. I don't want a mansion. I don't care about any of that stuff. I want to be with him forever. And I don't want anything here. I don't want to allow anything here. No sin, no wickedness, no pleasure, no compromise. The love of money, whatever it may be. Lust, sexual immorality. I don't want any of that to stop me. 
that temporary pleasures of the flesh to stop me from being with Jesus forever and ever. I don't want anything to get in the way. That's why the true Christian who loves Jesus says, I will cut off anything that is trying to trip me up, hinder me, or take me down. And the true pastors and preachers of the gospel will try to remind you and show you stuff that will try to be a stumbling block to you and try to take you down. Because a true pastor, a true minister of the gospel wants to stop you from going to hell and make sure you make it to heaven. That's what we want to do. I don't care about a big church. I don't care about big money. I don't want it. When I came here 15 years ago, I said, I'm not here to build a mega church. And we have not, obviously. <laughs> you know what's funny, though? Even my enemies, even people that hate me, and I'm talking about Christians, watch our services every Sunday. They can't seem to pull themselves away because I live rent-free in their heads. Because deep down they know. They may not like me. They may not like some of the things I do. They may not agree with me on some things. But deep down they know he is a preacher of righteousness. And they go listen to others and they don't hear the same sound. They don't feel the same anointing. And they go, and they go, what's he saying today? I got to go hear it. And I'm like, praise God. Keep on listening. But at some point, they're going to have to decide. Not that they have to come to church here. But they're going to have to decide. What are they going to support with their time, their energy, their life, their money, what are they going to support? Are they going to support what will bring people to Jesus, what will bring people to repentance? Or are they going to keep supporting the crack, cotton candy church? Like Joel Osteen. That's a crack fair for sure. Your best life now and all this nonsense. Now, what does crack do to you? I know I had a friend that got addicted to it. Makes you feel good for a while, doesn't it? Until you lose your car and your house, your health, and finally, your life. It's my friend that took all of that from him. And he was a Christian. He lost everything. He lost his wife. He lost his daughter. He lost his successful business. He lost everything. Ended up in prison, got out of prison, ended up back on it, the crack. Though he had lived for Jesus for three years and stayed clean, stayed free. And he went back to crack. And it finally gave him a heart attack and he died. One of my best friends. I loved Ray. I prayed for Ray. He would call me through the years. It's a sad thing to think that he might not have made it. Probably didn't, the way it looks. See, this, this thing that we do, this uh, preaching the gospel is life and death. The wages of sin is death. That means eternal separation from God. Jesus commanded his disciples, go preach repentance for the remission of sins. You have to, and that means you have to turn from your sin and wickedness and follow him. And that doesn't matter if you're totally unsaved or you've been a believer in Jesus for decades. If you've fallen away. See, this is one of those sermons that if I died tomorrow, I, I know I'm good. I know there's not going to be any blood on my hands or in my skirts. I know I'm not going to be standing there without the robe of righteousness, the wedding garment on. And that's what I've said. If all of you leave... Because you can't handle it anymore. I will still be preaching it. 
if I have to go down to the corner. You understand? Because I will not abandon the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. You know, we talk about healings and miracles, and I believe in all those things. I've seen Jesus do all those things. But the greatest miracle, the reason the angels rejoice in heaven is when one sinner truly repents. When one sinner turns from wickedness and comes to righteousness, all of heaven, all the angels in heaven rejoice over that. The greatest thing you can do as a Christian is preach the true gospel to someone and that brings them to true repentance and true faith and a true walk with Jesus Christ because you shared the truth with them that set them free. That's the greatest miracle there is to see someone transformed, given the ability by God to repent and yielding to that and truly repenting and seeing their life changed. Them either being born again for the first time or them being renewed revived in their faith and their walk with God. And we're all called to be that light to the world, not just the pastors and the fivefold ministers. There's nothing greater than that. Yes, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, healing, miracles, all of that. I've seen it all. I believe it all. want it all. want more of it to happen. But that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is not miracles. The ultimate goal is not supernatural manifestations. The ultimate goal is to see sinners come to repentance, whether they have never known Jesus or they've known him and fallen away from him. To bring sinners to repentance is the number one goal, should be the goal of every pastor, every church in across the world. I don't care where they are. That should be the number one goal. Not money, not numbers, not buildings, not lands, not fame, not TV programs, not trying to be, have a million followers or two million followers in social media. I mean, this is, people are obsessed with these things. That's not what he called us to do. He called us first and foremost to live and then preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, period. And if your church is not preaching that, it's time to come out of her. It's time to find a group of people that you can do that with. Because let me tell you, some of you, if your children don't sit under true godly preaching, you're going to for sure almost assuredly damn them to hell because they're going to hear the counterfeit. They're going to hear the watered-down version. It's going to be sown in them as children, and they're going to grow up with it. And you wonder why they won't listen to you when they get older. See, one thing we've seen, we've seen some children grow up here that rebelled. John, they didn't, they didn't, they heard it. The truth got sown in them. Y'all came when he was eight years old. He kind of went his own way for a while. But that seed that was sown in him brought him to true repentance, and he's on fire for the Lord now. And how old is he now? 24. He came, he came here when he's eight years old. And see, you know what happened? Even in his time when he was kind of doing his own thing and living in the sin and living in the world, and he's probably watching. Love, John. He knew deep down. He stayed convicted. He knew the truth. He'd even tell the truth to his friends because he couldn't keep it in because his heart had been filled with the truth of God's word. And it brought forth the fruit it's going to bring forth. And this is why I, I wouldn't dare allow my children to sit in these crack churches, these cotton candy carnivals. Oh, but they got a great youth program. Yeah, they do. They play video games. They play video games and sneak off and have sex. Sometimes even in the church building. Oh, yeah. Yeah. First Methodist Church down here when I was in high school used to have big dance parties in the church basement on the weekends playing secular music, dancing. We'd come in there drunk. Boys and girls would slip off in different parts of the church and be having fornication. She, yeah, Cindy knows. It was well known. That, that was, 
I, First Methodist Church in Opelika used to be the club for teenagers. I remember they had a little swing outside. Remember the outside of there? I used to sit in that little swing high and drunk. A lot of us did. Did you hear that? I mean, isn't that something that the party place in town was the First Methodist Church? Put on by the youth pastor. I know you weren't a member. I wasn't either. But she went there. That's what she's saying over there. She said, I wasn't a member, but I went there. Yeah, we all did. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, great youth program. How about, how about these? Uh, oh, well, let's have lock-ins. Remember those? Boys and girls sleeping all night in the church. What? What are you thinking? Who came up with that great idea? I'm telling you, it's all insane, man. Anyway, show me anywhere in the Bible that says have a youth group and a youth pastor. It's usually a big problem. Because I tell you what, I believe the young people, whether teenagers or what, supposed to, should be in the church listening to the pastor who is a mature man of God instead of uh, a young person like them who's been put in authority too early. But that's another sermon. I need to quit, don't I? Pretty crazy, though. So I could, we could, there's far more stories we could tell about that. We don't need these places, these congregations of the dead. I'm praying more and more people come out of them and come awake and come to Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. We don't want the shields of brass, Lord. We want the shields of gold. We don't want the counterfeit. We want you. We want your presence, your glory, your anointing. And that true anointing and that true glory comes with the true fear of the Lord and the trembling at your word and the respect that you are due as God Almighty, as the creator of heaven and earth, as the judge of the living and the dead, as the one who is holy. I love when Isaiah saw you, even though he was a prophet, when he saw you high and lifted up and s s seated upon your throne, he said, woe is me, for I am undone, I am unclean. When your glory is truly revealed, we realize how unclean we realize the sin. We realize the compromise. We realize that we need to change. We need to repent. We need to confess. We need to get right with you. That's real revival. And, Lord, we want real revival. We don't want counterfeit. We don't want emotional hype. We don't want counterfeit spirits, demon spirits, familiar spirits kundalini spirits we don't want any of that evil compromise we want the real anointing the real gifts of the holy spirit the real power from heaven lord i pray today that if anybody here today or listening if they've been backslidden lukewarm christian or if they've never truly surrendered to you and been born again and truly repented I pray that that take place in their lives, that they would yield to you. They would not be like I was when I was 16 when I said no and ran away, but that they would surrender their lives, that they would give up their sin and their wickedness, turn from it, receive forgiveness and the cleansing of your precious blood, and then walk with you. Lord, I pray this for them out there, Lord, and, and here pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, it is after one, well, it's almost one o'clock. Y'all know the drill. Hug some necks before you leave. God bless y'all.